you know, we have John's embarrassing moment that he includes for our benefit, where he falls at the feet of the angel and worships the angel, and the angel says, no, you, you can't do that. And the danger of us, of worshipping forms of church success, or ministry success, or people who have a particular anointing, real or perceived, are we worshipping them or are we worshipping God who is blessing us and blessing others through them? Welcome to this week's Calling a City to Life, a podcast by Queen's Park Baptist Church in Glasgow. I don't care whether it's morning, whether it's afternoon or whether it's evening. All I care about is we made it to the end of the book of Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> are you all as delighted about that as I am? I mean, it's not that I didn't I'm enjoy sad. it. I loved it. I loved it. But it's good to make it to the end. Well, can I just say, Richard, we haven't quite oh. made it to the end yet because... Oh, no. Well, we're still to do the podcast, haven't we? Yeah, oh, good right, okay. point. <laughs> so it's the beginning of the end. I was end. thinking of just stopping here, the beginning <laughs> of the end. The end of the beginning. I'm sad. We've got, I, I want to know, so in, in your respective Bibles, when you turn past Revelation 22, what's next? And mine, it's a concordance. Have you got notes or maps or just the end, the end cover? The Bible that I normally use is pretty much just the the, the other fly page or whatever it's called before the, right, okay. the cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, what's, that, what's after Revelation 22 in yours? Oh, I don't have mine sitting here, but I think that it's maps. Maps. Ian? I have a table of weights and measures. Uh, which, <laughs> uh, which is the one page of the Bible I, I generally tend not to use and I hadn't really realised it, it was there but I can tell you how many minas are in a talent and how many <laughs> talents are in a shekel and two uh -huh. thirds of a two thirds of a shekel is a pim um, so uh -huh. yeah so I can tell you all that I think in order to decompress from Revelation we should have a sermon on that just to bring us all back down. Well, I was more thinking that the the angel we've got as the building surveyor might really want that. Exactly. Table. So, yeah. Might want that included. There's, there's a poor old building surveying angel up there just waiting for someone to talk about <laughs> weights and measures. <laughs> and we've chosen to stop at the end of Revelation 22. Anyway, there we go. So, yep, we made it. Well done to everybody listening. You have been on this journey with us. I know... Many, many people have enjoyed exploring Revelation in the way that we have done both in the church services and on the podcast. So let's 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 land this baby. Let's land Revelation twenty two. Brody, give us give us a summary. Uh, so my well, you didn't ask for the sixty second summary. How long should I go on for? You've now? got I'll ten and, minutes. I'll, I'll try and do, <laughs> do sixty seconds. Um, so I think where I started on Sunday, if I can remember that far back, is to say that at the end we need to remember something of the beginning. You know, there's a there's a sense of you know in our euphoria of we've made it, we've gone through the book that we forget that. This is a book written to seven real life churches facing real life issues, and it's meant to help them with that. Um, and therefore, at the end, as we uh, land with this, of so what differences all of this made, or is this making to how we live? How then should we live? Um, chapter 22 has these images um, of the tree of life and the river of life. The tree of life is on both sides of the river. I don't know how that works um, because it's it's in the singular, both in our English translation and the original Greek. Um, but for me, I, where I went with it is that it speaks not just of fruitfulness, like an, an overabundant fruitfulness, but also of availability and access that um, the river and the tree are accessible uh, for all and by all. Um, I, and also uh, the, the image that John ends with, again, is of, of God and the Lamb. And this whole idea of, of uh, the character of the Lamb saying something about... Um, the means is the end, that the means of the lands that the lamb's victory um, is congruent with the end. And 
that future that we see challenges how we live now um, in three, well, in all of our lives, but if we're to kind of like group them together in a uh, politics, so not politics with a capital P necessarily, but how we do life together, um, economics and uh, I use the third category as as hope. So politics, the healing of the nations, how do we get on with each other? Um, is I guess where I went with that. Um, stop building barriers and walls and start to kind of like connect um, with each other. Economics, uh, a new understanding of what counts for wealth. Um, that it's not the metric that the world gives us. Um, and also that if we have a new understanding of what counts for wealth, then we realise that contrary to kind of like um, Adam Smith and every economist since him, that economics isn't all about supply and demand and scarcity and exclusiveness, i.e. what I can accumulate, um, but it's about abundance in God and an open-handedness uh, towards each other. And our hope is um, is in Jesus, is in the Lamb. Um, he is victorious and therefore um, while there's bits of the picture that are still a bit fuzzy, that doesn't matter because we know the one in whom we are placing our hope and that he is one who is faithful and true and just. Um, so we cry with John and with the early church. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So that's my 60 second summary. I'm not sure whether that was 60 seconds or not. I have no idea. <laughs> a, a, a minute is like an hour, a day is like a thousand years. It's absolutely yeah. fine. Amen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so to take it right back to the beginning, as you said, about remembering this is a letter to seven churches, a circular letter. It was taken around the doors and presumably read out loud and to a certain extent emphasised and acted out by the reader. Here's a, here's a, a, not a controversial question, but us sitting in our Glasgow church in 2023, the letters being written to us today by some apostle sitting on an island somewhere, what of the qualities in Revelation do you think would be being written to us just now as Queen's Park Baptist Church, as Christians in Glasgow, as Christians in the West? I think in many ways um, the categories that I mentioned would still be the categories of um, Jesus is Lord. So even to, to say Jesus is Lord is to make a political statement. Um, and it is to, as I said on Sunday, it is to dethrone all other claims of lordship over us, um, of a reorientation of our politics, of, of how we organise ourselves, is how we define who is, who is us. Because um, uh, a lot of politics, Carl Schmitt, the, the famous German F political theorist who wrote a book called Political Theology was a great influence on, um, on uh, among others, Adolf Hitler, etc. You know, for him, politics was all about defining who we are and who the enemy is, because if you're not us, you're the enemy. So a redefinition of that, that flows into our economics and flows into, so I put hope but I was kind of like influenced in some of this by um, uh, Miroslav Wolf and Ryan uh, McAnally Linz, and they say they, they, their third category was was religion. And if we remember, as we've gone through this book, the number of times we've talked about worship and false worship of idolatry, and we live in an age of idolatry. You know, mm -hmm. people might have given up in God, but they sure haven't given up in worship because they're worshiping all kinds of stuff. And that affects us because it's the air that we breathe. It's the culture that we live in. Um, it's a world that we, we're part of. So one of the things I did talk about on Sunday that I didn't put in the, the 60 second summary is, you know, we have 
John's embarrassing moment that he includes for our benefit where he falls at the feet of the angel and worships the angel and the angel says, no, you, you can't do that. Um, and the danger of us of worshipping forms of church success mm -hmm. or ministry success or people who have a particular anointing, real or perceived, of, you know, are we worshipping them or are we worshipping God who is blessing us and blessing others through them? Of, you know, that keeping those lines, demarcations clear, but also all the other stuff that we can end up um, uh, worshipping uh, erroneously. So I think the categories would be, be, be similar. Uh, the details might be different. The imagery might be updated. <laughs> Ian, you get a letter from some apostle in... <laughs> It was in the Bible. What what does it say? Uh, lots of things. Depends what letter mm -hmm. it is. Um, I think if you're asking the question, um, you know, what are a couple of things that Revelation is saying to us today? Um, then I think one of the things that kind of stood out from what Brody said for me was this whole thing about um, about God's people getting incorporated into the throne. That somehow there's this, we're part of this this reigning thing, and the phrase that uh, stuck in my mind is that we are training for reigning. Uh, I don't know if that's a bit of a, um, a, a superficial kind of phrase, but I remember reading a book in the back of a van in France when I was about 19 or something, and it stuck with me uh, for a we'll, we'll come back to We'll come back to that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the why you were stuck in a van in France. Go on. Um, but yeah, it, it's a book um, called Destined for the Throne by a guy called Paul Bilheimer. And um, um, I guess it was big all those years ago. But he basically said that one of the things, if not the thing that God is doing, is preparing a people who will one day reign with Christ and part of our life on this planet is to learn how we might be the eternal bride of Christ and exercise uh, an authority that is given to us. Um, so, for example, one of the things he said is that the world is a laboratory in which those destined for the throne are learning in actual practice how to overcome Satan and his hierarchy. The prayer closet is the arena which produces the overcomer. Um, and so, you know, part of his whole idea is that we are not just preparing to kind of have an eternal sing song, but we're preparing to be in an eternal position of spiritual authority, which we will exercise. And we learn that now. So I guess one of the things I think Revelation tells me is that we are in this moment learning what it is to exercise, albeit in a kind of broken down, um, stuttering kind of a way, how to exercise that spiritual authority that will one day be ours, not independent of Christ, but in him, in the throne room of heaven. Destined for the throne is the name of the book. That would tie into Genesis though, wouldn't it? Because... At the very beginning, we're we're to subdue, we're to reign over the land and everything. So it's that's like part of the original plan. Yeah, absolutely. I think, as I said the other week, we're on Plan A, <laughs> and uh, part <laughs> of that Plan A is about stewarding what God has has given to us, um, and um, that being reclaimed and redeemed and reshaped um, in the new heavens and new earth. Yeah, so God's God's dwelling place with humankind and our incorporation or participation into God's reigning is still part of plan A. Richard and I chatted some about where we would begin in discussing uh, Sunday today. And I think one of the things for me, and I don't know where, quite where it sits, so I'm chucking it in now, is the reflection on when you get to the end of Revelation, it feels like there's a moment required to wander in Scripture in and of itself because it's the completeness of the story. It's the fact that nothing is mi missed out. It's the complexity yet the simplicity of it. It's it's the wonder of God holding this all together. Um, it reminds me some of 
when when Job is getting frustrated with God, like sort of towards the end of Job, and and God says to him, "But how how do you know? You don't know what it's like to organize where the deer are going or you know whatever," and and it feels like as we come to this end of the end of Revelation, you are seeing the unified story that leads to Jesus. You are seeing this extraordinary outworking of all that we have needed and and his abundant love for his people and it's it's both you know simple and an extraordinary complex in the same at the same time it just is it's overwhelming and i and i feel the wonder of it so there's not so much really a question there as it is a statement <laughs> you're allowed to add to it <laughs> yeah i mean as as i was preparing for sunday um I was struck with various different parallels with John's gospel um, of we have here in pictorial form in some respects or in its fullness and completion. Um, Jesus is saying in John's gospel about, you know, him being the water. I'll give you water that, and you'll, if you drink of this, you'll, you'll never thirst. I've come that you might have abundant life and we have this abundance this um uh oh, super i don't know super exuberance is, is the wrong super aliveness um that we see in both chapter 21 and, and and 22 um and what does that mean for us as now um there's a danger that at one extreme we confuse that with a prosperity gospel in which wealth is measured just the same the way as it would be in Babylon. Um, and I don't think that's what Jesus was referring to when he talked about uh, abundant life. Um, but also kind of like the whole language of, you know, abiding in God and God abiding in us and and all of that. So I just saw a lot of that weaving into these these final uh, images that we get, um, which creates a, a heart response, a wholehearted response of, yes, Lord, I'm up for that. Come, Lord Jesus, um, come both into the present, into my, that I would have a sense of your presence now, that I would have a sense of the, the abundance of life in my horrible, rubbishy, difficult, dark situation because do you know what the light shines and the darkness can't overcome it but come in your fullness as well put all things right because i'm tired of everything being so or so many things a uh, being so a uh, so wrong so kind of like a a holy desperation and a holy dissatisfaction but also a shalom in the now of um god is is with us in the the uh, in the present so it's not just kind of like grin and bear it one day it will all be better but there's something of God's abundance and goodness for us to know in the now in the rubble of um, our current circumstances yeah Ian scripture is scripture is so much better than we think it is uh, it's so full of surprises and yet so full of consistency as well isn't it yeah. Um, and, you know, there, there are all sorts of breadcrumbs, like of a trail that are dropped through Revelation that kind of lead all the way back to, um, deep back into the Old Testament, into Genesis, as you said. Um, and then it gets wrapped up in that, just a little um, sound bite, you know, where, where Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You know, the whole story is is wrapped up in his name um that he is the beginning of creation and and the beginning of the renewal of all things um so yeah it's it, it just wonderfully pulls together so many strands that are laid out in so many different books from so many different authors from so many different locations and experiences there's so many roads that find their destination in revelation 21 and 22 so in in ear ian's answer to uh, jackie there he can like mentioned alpha and omega i think it was ian or maybe it was jackie anyway um of so one of the things i didn't a uh, touch upon on sunday is just the um 
uh, the depth of the fullness of that that image that he is the first and the, the last and one of the things that that is communicating there and, and I think Ian said this several times over the week of um, the image that we have of this battle isn't a battle against equals. God always has been and always is the Alpha and the Omega. Um, so it's not like the other religions that would have been around at the time of when John's writing this of good and evil locked in some eternal combat um, or an our age of our um, sci-fi or superhero uh, movies. This is, it's not a battle against equals. God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Um, and that brings a, a, a humble confidence in the one that we are trusting and hoping and whose promises uh, we see throughout a uh, scripture. So that whole image of Alpha and Omega, I tried to get from a PowerPoint uh, a good photograph of the stained glass window that is behind anybody who preaches at QP because in the, the, the first tri-pitch and the third tri-pitch, there's Alpha and Omega at the top. Um, I failed miserably because I'm not a photographer. <laughs> This references back to something that you, oh gosh, I don't know what episode it was, but when you preached and talked about the lion and the lamb and you said that Jesus is never the lion, he's always the lamb. And you talked about the fact that in chapter 22, the, the lamb is the abiding image. We're cut, you know, it's still the lamb. And I wondered if we could just discuss a little the whole lion and the lamb thing, because I spoke to someone who actually, I think, was confused a little bit about what you were saying. It wasn't, and what I understood was there was no suggestion from you that the description of Jesus as the lion was incorrect. It's just that the lion doesn't look like a lion. The lion looks like a lamb. They are effectively, because you hear lion, but you see lamb, and it's because it's alternative to. Is that correct? Kind of. I think it's also, we wish lion and we wish a line that is a li line. You know, when we, when we, well, at least me, I'll use I language. Okay. <laughs> when somebody offends me or does something against me, the aggressive wee Scottish man wants to come out the grave and smack them one. Um, but that's the old me that, that, that died in the baptismal tank. Um, uh, and so often, you know, when we kind of like feel marginalised or put aside or put down, we want the kind of triumph that would be kind of like the tooth and claw triumph of a lion. We want that kind of power. But lion power is is Babylonian power. It's worldly power. It's the power of, of Rome. And what we see throughout God's dealings with humankind and supremely on the cross is that God's power is totally different, that it's God's weakness that is actually turns out to be, to use I think a phrase Ian's used a few times of God, God's weakness is stronger than the power of the most powerful lamb, a eh, lion rather. It's more powerful than, than anything like that. And I think that then means that when it comes to what does it look like to live this out, so often things that we could do, a kind word to somebody can seem so insignificant, can seem so weak and powerless in the face of bombs and bullets and goodness knows what else that are going on in our world. It can seem so weak and ineffectual. And yet, I think that's got lamb power in it, especially when it's done in the spirit um, and, and guided by a uh, guided by God. So that's that's I think where where the, the, the lamb thing is the the title of the Jesus is the line of the tribe of Judah is an honorific title um, and that's quite often connected with 
the whole link to the divinic line. So that's that's part of saying Jesus is the real deal. He is the everlasting king, the one who sits on the throne. He is the Messiah of God's people. Um, that's what that's referring to rather than the means or the kind of power that's exercised. That's how right. I would, would understand yeah. it. That's super helpful because that's what I was going to ask is obviously the title is used in scripture. So you can understand that people would be like, hold on, but that's what it says in verse whatever. Yeah, it's, so, it's, yeah, it's in yeah. Genesis 30 something other that, that you have Ooh. this this title. I think it's Genesis 32. Uh, don't quote me on that. You would need to, to check it. It's, it's around <laughs> about there that we have this title line of the tribe of of yeah. of, of Judah. Um, you understand that this is a podcast. So I was going to say, I was you gonna say that. we're actually quoting you that it's Genesis 32 because it's just been recorded that you said it was Genesis 32. So yeah, but you, you, you know me, I'm a, I'm approximately right in, in these things, not it's always super accurate in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> yes, I, I think it's probably also just worth commenting that I mean I think for us. Lion speaks of, of grandeur and honour. So as a particular resonance in our our culture, and maybe C.S. Lewis has something to do with that uh, as well from the Narnia <laughs> stories. But actually, the the lion has uh, has various char- characteristics, and quite often in the scripture, the lion is actually a threat and a danger. It's a predatory mm-hmm. creature. Um, it's the devil that's the roaring lion. Um, so I think we just need to be careful about using that in a way as a title because it, it, is, it is used in multiple ways in scripture and actually mm-hmm. um, probably not, I haven't quite counted them up, um, but um, actually probably more often than not, lion is is associated with um, with threat and danger rather than with the grandeur that we might um, immediately kind of think of it. So, yeah, it's been used in different kinds of ways. So you can't just simply attribute it as a characteristic of God. Yeah, snakes would be another one like that, wouldn't it? That you can't just assume. I'm trying to think if I'm trying to think if snakes actually have any kind of positives in the scripture. Is there a positive thing for a snake? <laughs> <laughs> Lions at least get some positivity amongst all the negativity, but. Um... <laughs> There's there's some for something to go and look for. Is a, is there a good Moses? snake? Yeah. Moses. Well, it, yeah. Mo- yeah. 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 Yay! I got an answer right. That's where I was thinking, but yeah. <laughs> well, I guess Sorry, the, <laughs> that snake does get converted, doesn't it? So maybe that's what happens. Yes. Gets converted into a <laughs> a stick, so it's useful. I think as well, there's a real challenge for us in. You know, here we are at the end of the book and we know who wins and it's the lamb that wins. Mm. And because the lamb wins, we win. And the danger is that if we can like adopt the characteristic of the line, the proud line, that that transforms into an ugly kind of triumphalism um, that is judgmental in a way that Jesus, that the lamb isn't judgmental. So how do we express the victory that we have in Christ, the, the ruling? Um, so I, I joked on Sunday that actually in Revelation 22, we have the scariest picture in the Bible of us on the throne because I've <laughs> seen what happens when people get a yellow vest or a yellow jacket. You know, the power goes to their heads. And that speaks something of this proud, domineering, vainglorious line kind of triumphalism. Thank God we get sanctified Mm. and are transformed. But that is what is meant to be working in our lives now. So again, I cry, come Lord Jesus, because there's so much for you still to do in my life that I am so far from, you know, I need more training. Um, I need to train um, or allow your spirit to train me better and to stop being resistant and lazy and to be active and cooperative uh, in what you're looking to uh, to do in my life. Hmm. Well, a good building surveyor will always have a yellow jacket, so maybe it's going to be... <laughs> Hive his best <laughs> on angels in heaven. But maybe that's just taking a bit too far. Uh, but to continue the theme of building surveyors and, if you like, impossible buildings, you touched on the tree of life 
on either side of the river. I know Jack's got some thoughts on that, which we'll come back to in a minute. I wanted to ask a bit about the next bit in verse two, about the tense. I don't know if you know the answer to this. It says, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And I'm curious about that because that makes it sound like that the if there's no access to the tree until chapter 22, if you like, and the tree is for the healing, suggests to me there is some sort of process that is ongoing actually within eternity. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Yeah, and this this is this is where we're getting into the we see the outline of the picture, but we're not we're a bit fuzzy on some of the the, the details. So you know, what is the reigning that we are going to be doing? Um, yes, I was going to ask that. If everybody's reigning, who are we reigning over? <laughs> if well, if everybody's well, in charge, well, there, uh, there there are those who are outside, isn't? <laughs> you know, well, us that's that. I was going I, I was going to come on to that again. <laughs> man. I think that might be a whole series all by itself. Um, uh, but who's outside the wall? And you're going to get a huge number of different answers um, on that. Where a lot of contemporary theologians have gone with this um, is to uh, talk about that in heaven there will be godly work to do um, and how that informs our work uh, this side of uh, Christ's second coming. So that's one of the places they go. I'm, I'm trying to look up my interlinear to see what the tense is on uh, that bit Richard, so I think, if, I think Ian is doing. I, I'm doing this like very he's doing same exactly thing. The same thing, if the truth be told. And I can find, <laughs> I can find no verb. So um, that's really interesting. So it's there a might preposition. Not be, yeah. Okay, Brody's got it. <laughs> Go for it. I love watching them work. This is funny. <laughs> is that a preposition <laughs> or is it? Is it passive? This is how the sausages are made, folks. Yeah. No. It, it's. It's a. I wonder if it was one of these present tenses. Are, so present are the healing? Tenses. Um, is wait a second. I'm just trying to get it. Are the healing so that the, <laughs> uh, the Greek word uh, uh, are the I'll... healing therapian is a noun. Um, fs. I'm just. I'll edit in out. some lift on hold music just to hear <laughs> like the just take, to hear the wheels the turning. Heart music that they used to use on telly. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's it's in its feminine form and it's a superlative, um, yeah, and it's an adjective. <laughs> so yeah. can I go back to talking about the tree then, seeing as yeah, Richard's sorry, just... <laughs> <laughs> well, so as far, so, as, I, as, far I can, as I can see, it says the trees for the healing of the nations. Uh-huh. No tense. Right, oh. okay. Yeah, no so verb. It's a preposition. Yep. I'm tense. Noun, <laughs> as, accusative feminine singular. Is what oh, healing is in. Of course it is. <laughs> Richard and grammar aren't the best, so at that no, point no, no, you've no. just lost him. <laughs> I, I know what a noun is. <laughs> Do you? Do you really? <laughs> Normally, it's not got a capital. No, that's a proper name. I don't that's know. That's a pronoun, anyway, darling. Never mind. Pronoun, okay, sorry. <laughs> so back <laughs> to the tree. Week. Back to the trees. Talk to me about trees, Jack. So the, tr- the trees on both sides of the river. Mm-hmm. Uh, and thoughts that I had were, well the sort of thinking that they were the same root system was part of it, which wasn't sort of massively significant. But then further in my thinking was that rivers often divide lands. So they often are actually creating division amongst people. And obviously this is doing the opposite because the river is not actually dividing people. All peoples are there and together and the tree is there abundantly for everyone. It's not like one thing is available on one side of the river and one not. The river is running through. And it actually is quite an extraordinary picture the more you think of it being one tree. Yeah, I mean, I think the key point is that it's 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 available, it's accessible um, to everybody, just as the same way as you can access a river from both banks of. Um, there are some people that would pluralize it, um, both of them, oh. of you know rivers and trees. So every street in the city has this river flowing through it. It's some kind of like I've never been to Venice, but some kind of Venice with. 
sidewalks beside all these <laughs> this water, but it's all the same water and it's all the same wow. trees uh, or tree. Um, but I think of just this super fruitfulness, super abundance, accessible. So, um, you know, the, the gates of the walls of this city are are, are permanently open. Um, uh, yeah, which again speaks of 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 access. Um, and I think again the challenge there is, you know, when we become so convinced that you know we've got it right to the exclusion of everybody else, or as we've seen um, in various parts of the world of the cross being used as an exclusive political symbol to. Um, have power over and dominate other people and exclude them or marginalize them of you know the cross is the cross is the cross is Jesus <laughs> you know the, the tree is, is Jesus is this this life it's, it's, it's his it's not my possession it's a gift to us for our benefit um, so Brody I have a question sorry Jackie I know this is oh, your role brilliant. but I have a question no, you go for it so, trees for the healing of the nations, no verb. Um, eh, why do the nations need healing in the new heavens and the new earth? Are they still causing problems? Or is this um, a hangover from the past? So, <laughs> Jackie's just fallen over his chair. Yeah, see, I don't have an answer for that, Ian, is, is the question. I think... See, I'm going to write into this podcast with questions now. I've decided. <laughs> yeah. but, Ian, Ian, Mr. E Anonymous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, I mean, that would be me because that that leads into that leads into a whole load of other controversial kind of mm. questions. <laughs> of, I'm glad we so said the controversy to the last episode. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are some people who would say that what we have is is these multiple endings so you get the ending of the destruction of of babylon that's one possible ending but the other possible ending if if, if there is this repentance is what we have in in chapters 21 22 so rather than being sequential that it's an either or that we're presented with a uh, here um my takeaway of it is do you know what i don't know but God's given us a picture of what the future is like for us to participate in now. So there's yeah. a calling upon us now, there's a calling upon the church now to be active in the healing of the nations. And part of that healing, because, um, I mean, there's so many different levels, you know, so some of the stuff that they're talking about at COP28, just now about reparations for environmental stuff, that's part, for me, that's part of the healing of the nations. A, a simpler level where, you know, how do you and I get involved in this? It's got to do with our attitudes to people of other cultures and races and ethnicities. My uh, both a uh, a. Uh, conscious and unconscious mm. biases um of a you know i so confession time i was hill walking the other week there and i got to the summit and here there was a guy in the summit with an english accent who greeted me in gaelic now Ooh. i don't know gaelic because of political decisions that were made centuries ago which means that my forebears weren't allowed to speak Gaelic I nearly clocked the guy and I, I keep talking about wanting to punch people but you probably saved all the violence until the new heaven and the new earth yeah. the violent bit was two chapters ago but I thought how how dare he the people who stole my language from me greet me in it was was my natural reaction but then given yeah. that you're speaking He's English well, just given that you're speaking English, it seems to me you have appropriated his language as well. So he had every right to do the same to you. Yeah, yeah, really. But anyway, I need the healing of the nations in my life, yeah. you know, because of the stuff that, that comes comes out of, of... We live in a world that is increasingly become fragmented. And in, in mm. So there's one sense that 
that communication and mass media and things like that has made us more like a global village. But we're a global village in which we dislike everybody <laughs> who's not <laughs> like us. Um, uh, and therefore, there's a work of the Spirit there that I think is a call upon the church in this healing of the nations of how how do we work with the Spirit so that a uh, the church now looks like the throne room of God in chapter five, where identifiably there's these different peoples and languages and nations. So sure, that's got to do with mission. Um, and maybe we need people from the global south to come here and do mission. In fact, there are people doing that. So it's not just about us sending people, but receiving people. But also, can, I, can we stand shoulder to shoulder with people who are different from us, speaking a different language, to, to worship in a holiness and love and, and unity. Hmm. You guys are sitting there with your interlinears and your strongs. I did wonder as to whether the word healing is the best translation of Greek because it made me think as to whether it was more a building up of the nature. So it wasn't coming from a negative. It was actually about an improving. So, it, you know, because it's possible for something to be no, it's probably for something not to be bad, but also not to be absolutely perfect or completed. But I, I don't know whether there's any kind of angle on that in the in the particular word that's used, seen as my Greek stuff's about 50 yards away from where I'm sitting. <laughs> and if I type, you're going to hear it on the edit. <laughs> uh, Jack? I mean, I don't have an answer. <laughs> you weren't well, you weren't wanting an answer. Well, you I was, looked like you you looked like you had another question. I I mean, I do have other questions, but the boys might well, want to respond. Well, I I mean, it is the regular word for healing, curing healing. of a general mm. kind. Um, but there has to be healing in the world to come. Um, because our souls need to be cured. Um, not annihilated. Or rejected so there is a transformation of the broken parts of our lives and in some way some mysterious glorious way they're integrated into what we are in the future so there are there has to be some kind of repair i mean if you think about your memories so you've got a bad memory you know but you've got a, an injured memory there's a, an injury of heart um so that has to be transposed into some kind of way in the new heavens and the new earth. Because if it's just simply eliminated, then part of your experience, part of your story has gone. But if it is remains in the same form, so it is, remains still heartful, then that's something that's not appropriate. So I would say that actually what we will experience, whether it's socially or personally, is a kind of a healing where we are aware of something of what has been our injury whether it's a social cultural political or personal injury but in, but it is redeemed and transformed and healed so that it is held by god in a way that is no longer damaging or destructive and, and no longer bears grudge or offense against other people or other nations so i i, I love that idea that it's that it's a healing that is going on that it's not just an elimination of the past and a forgetting but it's actually uh, a redeeming of that in, and transposing that into into heaven as part of this discussion Brody you've already mentioned the importance of seeing um, our lives as new creations to see our present reality differently it's not just in the future but it's now and I was wondering some if we could discuss what that looks like in terms of our responsibility to that. Because for me, I'm thinking there's an important part in submission there, in accepting, accepting the places where I clearly am not a new creation, the places which are more evidently broken and are bumping up against other people and so on. And really being willing to submit those things to God. Because I think sometimes there's a tendency for us, and I may be speaking for myself only, but there's a tendency to kind of see the broken parts of us and think, well, that will get resolved at some point. <laughs> once, once I see Jesus face to face, 
then that's going to be resolved and I'll just wait for that point. As opposed to seeing that I have, that I am called to, that I have a personal responsibility to see that place of brokenness and being willing to submit it to him in the here and now. Yeah, so I guess there's at least two aspects to that. So there's the inner journey of healing and transformation. So me and my bad attitudes and <laughs> a your violence. violence. <laughs> yeah, well, well. So that's that's why one of the theologians um, I admire is a guy called Stanley Hervas, and Stanley would say, "I'm a pacifist, not because I'm good. I'm a pacifist because I'm a silent, violent son of a." And you can complete the rest of his yes. sentence, um, yeah. and and I recognise something of that in myself. When I was a kid, I was in a fight multiple times a week. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, um, wow. yeah. I was always in fights. Not even my own. Somebody would insult my brother, and I would jump off my bike and start a fight. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so I recognise something of that in myself, and you know. Jesus has changed me. So there's that inner work that that needs to be done of allowing God's spirit. Um, and I think this is where we go at the pace that the spirit is taking us at. Of well, when the spirit highlights something that we need to deal with, let's work with the spirit on that. And that may include, you know, get in prayer at Restorer on a Sunday morning and, and things like that. So we're not necessarily on our own with this, but doing that that uh, work with the Spirit um, on our inner lives. There's also our outward journey of, you know, when we're in our workplace or in our car or shopping and things like that, or we live within a broken system. And sometimes we are such an insignificant cog that it feels like we have no options you know, are very little options. Um, and there's a sense in which just even being aware of, you know, um, there are no good, there's there's better choices to be made, but there's not a perfect choice in, you know, um, in what I do here um, is healing itself. Because I, I think and a participation in, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing here. Um, in part of that longing for um, the renewal of all things and, and all things to be. So not everybody's got a choice of the job that they do. Sometimes I've worked jobs where, do you know what, it was the only job that I could get. It was necessity. You know, was it was it a job that can like, you know, I, well, you know, I struggled to kind of like, how does my theology of work fit with this rubbishy, job you know so for people that are working in amazon warehouses and things like that and who are saying do you know what it's as bad as they say you know that's not that's not a lifestyle choice <laughs> as mm -hmm. such that's a put bread and milk on the the table kind of thing um but recognizing that you know even within that are there moments of redemption? Are there glimmers of light that can break through? And for some people, it can be really hard to hey, hey, to see that. And again, so we cry, come Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As we circle for landing, I would just like to speak a little bit or ask you both a little bit about what we've done in the last... I don't know how many weeks we've been doing this. It's 22 chapters. I think it's maybe 17 weeks, is it? Maybe? 15 weeks? Something like that. We have yeah. we have skipped one or two um, yes. passages. and Merged one or two together. Yeah. I, I am curious about your experience of uh, preaching and then doing this as a podcast and the crosstalk with each other and with us and how people have spoken into what you've actually been speaking about i'm just trying to get an insight into how you feel the whole thing has held together well i think as ian beautifully illustrated with his question to me of certainly i'm not speaking for ian here but i am not an expert in everything about the book of revelation <laughs> there's still lots i'm like what do we do with this and what but I think getting that big picture, getting that shape, some of the big 
themes. And for me, a lot of it's just been seeing as you know, like Jackie alluded to earlier on of of you know what this is the this isn't some kind of like madcap ending to the book of hmm. this fits with everything else. Um, it's the same kind of like stuff about, you know, who's lord over our lives, who's shaping our desires, how are we living this out? Yes, that we live in a broken and hard world, but that God is with us in it and there's a glorious future um, for us uh, to to uh, participate in now, but also kind of like know that there's something glorious for us in, in, in the future of, of that's that's a message that's repeated so many different places mm-hmm. and the thread that runs through a, a through scripture. So hopefully, you know, one of the, the byproducts of it um are that the, the other people kind of see, oh, this is this isn't something radically different from what the gospels are telling us or what Paul is telling us or what the Old Testament prophets are telling us this. There's it's in a different key and the notes are slightly different, but it it's the same song in mm-hmm. some respects. And therefore people feel equipped and encouraged to read their Bibles, to engage with all of scripture, to ask, I think, you know, early on, Ian said, um, uh, one of the, the early weeks, Ian said, um, one of the things Revelation helps us do is to ask good questions, you know, good questions of the world around us. Um, but also hopefully, Ian and I have modelled something of how we ask questions of scripture so that it speaks to us. And I think that I just am in the really fortunate position of I don't do as much preaching as Ian. So I have the joy of listening to Ian as well and, and learning from him and uh, going, oh, yeah, that's. So the challenge for me in doing the podcast has been the weeks when I've not been preaching, but knowing this is coming up. I'd like, <laughs> I'd better at least read the passage and read some stuff about it so that I've got something to say. <laughs> Ian, how have you found the process and how have the congregation responded uh, through through the book of Revelation? I think, um, Richard, at a personal level, it's been really interesting having never preached really deep into Revelation before. I think, as Brody's mentioned, that idea of it being of finding familiar things in a fresh place. And I think that has just kind of given me personally just a fresh way of engaging with things that are true and things that have been uh, known, but just seeing them differently. So I I think that's, I find that really helpful and just kind of encountering God's word, but God's word expressed a different way. I think one of the big takeaways, and I think I kind of felt this at the beginning, um, and it's it's there in the title, Hope Over Fear, um, is that for many people, myself included, my experience of Revelation was that it had been weaponized to provoke fear. And a number of people have said to me that actually, for them, Revelation meant something fearful, which was used to, um, in some ways, maybe provoke a sense of guilt and fear. Um, and I, I think for many of us to recognise that the whole intention of this is actually to produce hope for people who are persevering um, and to get a vision for what God's doing, a big picture of what God's doing and to just appreciate the privilege of being part of that. I think that's been a significant shift for people, even just very simply, to be able to read this book not with fear, but with um, a posture of being able to um, take on board the truth that we have this immense hope, which enables us to to live in the challenges of the present. So I, a few people have said that to me, that actually they can read it now without fear uh, and actually are expecting God to say something hopeful in it. And I think that's a, that's a great mm-hmm. shift. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I I'd somebody Rich should come up to me on Sunday afterwards at, at coffee time and say something along the lines of, you know, what I I became a Christian when I was really young and it was dead simple. Jesus is my savior, and you know, but I I got that and I love Jesus and um all that sort of stuff. 
but the idea of eternity, I wasn't so sure about. And what you and Ian have said, the, 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 the vision of Revelation has really helped me kind of like not be fearful about eternity and what salvation actually means. Um, and I, I suspect if one person said that, then there's, there's others, because it's as, as somebody who is a teenager was gripped with an anxiety about kind of like eternity and I couldn't get my head around it um, of it's not something that we talk about in church because we're meant to be desperate to spend eternity with with a uh, God and I think uh, if, if what Ian and I have said over the past few weeks have, have helped some people on that journey and not to be anxious about Christ's second return but that it's something that we can look forward to, um, then, a, uh, then that's a great encouragement to us. Yeah, I think it has helped a lot of people, uh, very specifically with that. Well, let's uh, bring the show into a proper conclusion, and it wouldn't be a show without a bit of a non-biblical cultural reference or two. So, who wants to go first? You've now, boys, you've got no excuses. Your preaching and revelation is finished with. So I don't want to hear any of this. We're too busy. Well, Broad it was. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Ian. Oh, it's finished now. Throwing so, Ian under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> so who who's got a cultural cultural reference away from the Bible today? Brody, do you want to go first? Uh, so I've been enjoying a because I've I've been in the car more than what I would normally be. So I've done two things in the car. Um I listened to the rest of this history podcast, eight, eight, a eight episode series on um, uh, the conquistadors, um, a, but also kind of like a Glasgow band. There's a Glasgow band called Fats Suit, S U I T. Um, been enjoying their their album. It's it's from 2019, Waifs and Strays, and particularly. Their tune, Brum Doing a Wheelie. Because <laughs> I, I just love the title, but it's just a crack tune as well. Good stuff, Jack. Well, my only thing, I mean, I haven't, we haven't had much of a life lately. It's been a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> my life's been great. I mean, it's always <laughs> smiles and central heating and <laughs> sunshine and rainbows. It's, it's been a bit brutal, what with the weather and all, living on a farm lately. But when I was running, I discovered some really, really old Billy Joel albums. And there was one live at the Great American Hall. And it's from 1975, so like the year I was born. And it's so funny because he's, he's you know, famous, but not that famous. And he's speaking to all these sound guys as he's chatting along. And it's so basic and brilliant. And you hear all the stuff you don't hear now. And I just found it so enjoyable. Good stuff. Ian? I'm, yeah, I, I'm just, for all those people who don't have much culture in their lives, I'm your man <laughs> this week. So, yeah, I've nothing really to report. I've not listened to any music. Um, the, I, I have dabbled in a podcast, and actually um, it was the same one as Brody. Um, so I always listen to the rest as history in the car, but I've been following the um, assassination of JFK. So that's kind of been my interest. I have avoided the conquistadors and uh, realised that actually <laughs> um, the, the, all the, uh, the, the theories and um, ideas are probably all just conjecture and speculation. And it's all just one very simple tragedy. Yes, I will uh, lower the tone entirely because Christmas is coming and it got me thinking, uh, it reminded me of a website that you can go to and some of you are going to go, oh, and you're going to be listening to this and the first website you're going to go and Google is going to be this. It is a website that contains old Argos catalogues. So if you want to relive your youth, you need to search out, just Google it, old Argos catalogs and have a flick through the Argos catalog from like 1984 or 1992 or 77 and you'll be reminded immediately of your childhood and all those Casio watches and Lego sets and Skeletrix that you always wanted as a kid. So yes, I, I have I've come across that as an old thing and it's 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 some of the stuff you just completely forget even 
whole categories of things that just don't exist now, like bedside clocks, like, you know, pages and pages of them. And yet, you know, everyone just uses their mobile phone nowadays. Yeah. So there you go. I, and of course, Richard, many of us categories. were children before Casio watches were a thing, <laughs> uh, where you actually <laughs> had to, to wa- you wind need, you up to to- your watch in those days. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go to the Walkman page. Like pages and pages of Walkmans, just epic memories. Anyway, there we go. So let's, uh, before we do our conclusion, uh, let's just say what's happening next. So we're going to take a bit of a break from the regular uh, series of podcasts while Advent is upon us. There may be one or two specials that drop, so keep an eye out for them. And then we hope to restart in the new year. Are are we able to reveal what we will be... I mean, I'm assuming it's like the chapters 1 to 15 of Chronicles or something. We're just going into straight, you know, 15 weeks of numbers. No, we are, un- uh, we are starting to unable agree. at this stage to reveal where we will be or what we will be doing. To, it'll be a secret. Mm. It'll be a secret. It's like one of those, one of, like in Revelation where you eat it, you know, it's just, it's in a little, little book that gets consumed. So there we go. You'll need to tune in in January to find out all about that. We thank you all very much for listening and thank you all very much for all your encouragement doing this but before we go let's have a final thought and it can be on chapter 22 or on absolutely anything you want from the book of revelation jack i mean i'm just hugely comforted i'm one of those people who is just feeling the joy and encouragement of knowing that god is across it all and that i have total confidence in him and it's it's been wonderful. I've so enjoyed it. I do want to briefly share a song that I think that was really on my heart this week. So it's by a woman called T- Taylor Leonard, and she sings it with someone called Jess Ray. They are a group called Mission House, and the song is called Behold. I'll just read a couple of very short verses. The empty filled, the wounded healed, the broken back together. The poor are blessed, the weary rest, we will dance forever. The blinded see, the chained are free, the doubtful now believer, the outcast known, the orphan home, you are my redeemer. Behold, behold, behold what love can do. Behold, behold, he's making all things new. It is an epic song and I highly recommend you to listen to it. It just gets better and better. Great. Ian? It's hard to better that, isn't it? So, um, yeah, I think just want to finish off really by reminding people that this book, this word from God is gifted to us that we might have hope over fear. Um, So whatever people are fearful of, just get yourself back into Revelation and these wonderful images of of hope that God provides for us. Mm. Excellent. Brody, you preached it. Final word to you. I just love the profundity and depth and simplicity of the final prayer, Amen, come Lord Jesus. Amen. And praying that both for situations and people that I know, but also that in this Advent season, as we wait for his return of come Lord Jesus, and heal our broken world, make all things wipe away every tear, heal the nations. Set them short. Amen. Amen. Can't do better than that. Goodbye. 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 Bye. Bye.